you find out it's a long walk to the bathroom. And who needs that? So then you say, well, I, don't, I could live anywhere, so why should I live at Versailles? It's a pain in the neck. Uh, this would be my hope for virtual reality that I think I've told you this fantasy before, and virtual reality brings it one step closer. Here's my vision of, of the future Eden. It looks like the Earth looked 20,000 years ago. It's absolutely, there are no cities. There's no visible industry. There are no roads, no, no measurable pollution, no radiation. And when you zoom down on this world, you discover human beings apparently living in some kind of uh, primitive state, naked, nomadic, tribal, so forth and so on, but at equilibrium and seemingly amazingly healthy. Well, so then you further zoom into this scene and now you're behind the eyebrows of one of these naked nomadic human beings and you discover that uh, there are menus when you close your eyes and there's an interface when you close your eyes and you can just pull down these menus and sit down on the beach and move off into worlds uh, that are different from your own ecosystem or that are highly technically advanced, that are you know, f- much more technically advanced than our own world, but it's all virtual. It all exists in a completely non-invasive, non-destructive dimension. The entire thing is being run by a computer the size of a Maytag washer that is kept in the potala in Hwasa. And other than that black object, everything else on the earth appears completely primitive. But inside the minds of these people, there are myriad virtual worlds that they're moving in and participating in and living in. This is doable. The question is how to avoid cultural crack-up. I mean, if we had $10 million, we could deliver this for a 100 spoiled rich people. The trick is how are we going to deliver it to 5 million people and navigate ourselves through the various energy locks, resource locks, and political mind locks that we have to get through to get to that place. But that's my idea of living in the imagination. A realized physical body in a, in a perfected and preserved natural environment, but a, a massive interface with the world of human culture that has been turned into light and electrons and data streams and nowhere comes to rest to distort matter or to force its imprint onto matter. Does that seem... That seems uh, several steps ahead. I think there's... I'm talking about the in-between. <laughs> you mean getting from here to... Oh, how to do it? Well, somebody said to me recently, uh, if you had an unlimited amount of money, how, what, how would you use it to save the world? And, uh, you know... A fighter plane, a trainer fighter, costs a hundred million dollars, and they order these things in lots of five hundred at a time. If somebody were to give a hundred million dollars to some kind of foundation that w- that was called the Save the World Foundation, a hundred million dollars will invested will generate ten million, eight to ten million dollars a year. Uh, This is a lot of money when spent in the information domain. It's nothing when you spend it on military hardware, but if you spend it on TV spots, uh, it gets you somewhere. I think uh, there hasn't been a massive investment in solutions. We think, you know, our... our, And I'm speaking for all of us, maybe I'm wrong, but we don't correctly perceive the scale of the various forces working in society. I mean, you have the military-industrial complex and you have the new age. Well, are these approximately equal or are we comparing an aphid to an elephant here? Well, 
it's very hard to say because they operate in different domains. In the realm of ideas, we seem fairly powerful. They seem fairly exhausted. They control the legal machinery. They don't even control the media. The media is a really perverse creature. It's driven by an utterly amoral curiosity. And if you're weird enough, they'll come to you and put you in front of millions of people, no matter whether you blew up a school bus or what? It's only if you've got somebody who's got the bucks that can buy the space for you. That's not true because it's um, public relations people. They can get you on anything if they know what they're doing. This is a public relations person. (laughs) Well, see, I I think that uh, the New Age has its patrons, but the amounts of money that move around are trivial in terms of getting anything done. if if a foundation had five to ten million dollars a year to spend and it spent it in a truly visionary way I mean the institution itself has to be correct it's just not a free ride for uh, you know the people doing it but there are projects that could be pushed forward this virtual reality thing when I went down to see those guys I assume that it would be a shiny glass box and hurrying executives and this and that. I mean, it is, after all, a major software company. Well, my God, it's just a science fair project run amok. And everybody has hair down to their ass and their cigarette butts stabbed out in styrofoam cups and, and waste paper everywhere. And the whole setup was put together and run for under $300,000. You know, so for pennies, they create s- electronic slingshots with which to fell the global dominator Goliath. And uh, I-, I said I thought I'd have to stand in line down here. Where's Disney? Where's everybody? Aren't you guys going to glory? And they said, Oh no, it's kind of you know people don't take us seriously, and they say we need to prove this and that and the other thing. I don't know. Yeah. I just kind of feel like like all these enormous humanitarian projects that require a lot of money seem like they would somehow have to come after people started talking to each other, stopping being afraid of life, afraid of their feelings, afraid of their fellows. I remember hearing you once say something like, what was it, uh, ordinary people talking to ordinary people. From my experience, I really remember that because from my experience, that's really difficult. And I think that's why my... my, uh, and the, the psychedelic experience was difficult for me because there was a lot of emotions. It was, I think, uh, ordinary me tr- communicating with ordinary me. I found it really scary and difficult. I wonder if why why we're so afraid of each other, at least speaking for myself, why that's so scary and afraid of the feelings and how that could be changed. Because it seems... But that's where the tension is, <laughs> is between the individual and the group. Well, I, you know, this is the ego thing and the need to dissolve, but the need to be safe. And it's very hard to learn surrender. I mean, often after these groups, people come up to me sometimes and say, you know, I thought I was crazy until I heard you speak. <laughs> and, you know, that means that the meme, the bridge is the strength because uh, this is an entirely legitimate idea. I don't care how peculiar it is. I know where I'm coming from and I'm not easily led down the primrose path. I'm puzzled that I have such a weird life, you know, that I mean I could I thought I would end up teaching French poetry in a decent girls school somewhere. <laughs> that was at one point my goal, but it's what happened to me is what makes me say what I have to say. I have no no proclivity for this stuff at all. I'm a tougher nut to crack than uh, most people. If it works for me, it will work for anybody, you know. I mean, it's a very generalized kind of thing. Uh, there's all these f- moving fronts of change have to move simultaneously. I mean, there's work on our relations to other people. There's work on our relation to the psychedelic experience. Then there's our acting as a meme transmitter and political force to the larger world outside. And, uh, 
you know, always carried on in the light of how ordinary we are. I mean, this is not an elitist thing at all. It's, it belongs to, if you can see lightning and hear thunder, you can have the psychedelic experience. Of course, what you make of it is your own business, but it's in the bones. It's more basic than the philosophies that have claimed human attention uh, through history. And um, I th- I'm hopeful in fact, in a way, there is a level in me where this is all a charade because I, f- I figure it's settled. You know, it's settled. And I don't know why we have to go through this period where we worry about it and struggle and tear our hair uh, because I really, at a very profound level, think we are now so close to this huge attractor into novelty there's no way out of here. I mean, it's coming. We dropped in the 16th century. Now it's beginning to come on, and uh, <laughs> there's no getting away from it. You can rave and rant all you want, but, uh, you know. So we just then, you know, have to sort of reassure each other and hang together. This boat will make it. And my God, what's coming is as to nothing what has been. I mean, what's coming is turmoil and turbulence that will tax the faith of a saint in, in reasonable conclusions because the whole world is going to undergo deconstruction. I mean, Gorbachev has it right, but he's so far the only guy saying, we did it wrong. 100% wrong. I mean, I apologize, but having said that, what do you want me to do? We did it wrong, and now we're going to pull it apart. And it's the task of someone playing pickup sticks. You know that game where the idea is to take the pile of sticks apart without this pile of sticks cascading and shifting? This is what has to be done. I mean, we've got nuclear arsenals, we've got bacteriological warfare, you've got racism, sexism, moneyism, all this stuff stacked up to the ceiling, and we just have to take hold. I think it's happening. I think that this democracy stuff is not the conversion of Marxism to another 18th century political system but that democracy is the biological way to organize society, that people power is not a political appeal, it's a biological appeal. I mean, of course, it's what ants have. They do it the way the genes want it done. They don't have an intellectual construct which then either a leading party or a military clique or a royal family or a bunch of gangsters get together and tell everybody how it's going to be. I think democracy is really the name for pragmatism, for do what works, free the people, channel the creativity of every individual into the social life of society not leaders and followers, not elites and masses, but an, a, a channeling of creativity into uh, the places where it needs to go. And I think that this is now unstoppable. The, the, uh, the glitch is China, but I'm very optimistic there. I think, uh, you know, watch the uh, anniversary, watch May and June, I don't think they can go through the anniversary. I mean, the Chinese have learned from what's happened in Western Europe. And in fact, really, what happened in Tiananmen Square freed uh, Eastern Europe because had they not had that horrendous example to guide them, you can bet they would have stumbled into some kind of uh, effort to suppress it. So, you know, democracy is this innate belief in people. It's a psychedelic uh, way of doing it. It's the closest we can get to anarchy. Anarchy, to my mind, is, of course, the ideal, but anarchy 
has to be mediated with polity. And the way you do that is, uh, is through democracy. What about, um, can you imagine a symposium of some kind, possibly even around Esalen, with some thinkers of, like your Save the World, I've been thinking about a foundation and actually thinking about getting, trying to pursue getting a grant of getting with people for a Save the Human foundation, you know, which is for, similar to the Save the World. I mean, so much energy and money is put into saving various things around us. And... Um, that would at least start a dialogue about these solutions. I mean, I don't see that it would be very difficult to get the money from foundations. No, this kind of thing is worth doing. I mean, you know, when we founded our botanical dimensions, our little plant survival thing, we assumed, because you hear so much about it, that the rainforest conservation field would be crowded with megabuck institutions. And... Even though it is so hot, and even though it's in all the newspapers, you'd be amazed what a small party it is. It's about 50 people worldwide who really care, who run these organizations, and they know how to get good PR, but you know, 50 people out of 5 billion are giving full time their effort to try and save the rainforest. Is uh, tremendous disparity between where resources are put and where they need to be put. Hopefully, you know, uh, awareness spread by whatever means would be followed on by a redesigning of the flow charts of where energy and attention goes. Uh, opening up the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe is going to reveal unbelievable toxic wastelands created by their... Uh, military industrial complex and you know the earth is in far worse shape than we think uh, that's why there has this forward escape notion this notion of intensifying uh, change by changing behavior through psychedelics is as far as I can see the only way out see I really think that if you're trying to change someone's psychology, uh, you have to change their behavior. It's more important than any other thing about them. I mean, I'm sure maybe some of you are analysts and this is known to be just malarkey. But, <laughs> but if I were a therapist and someone came to me and said, I'm a severely depressed, I'm a manic depressive person, I would not attempt to unravel their relationship to their father or their mother. Or I would say, how do you spend your day? How do you spend your life? And when they told me that they had a humdrum job and that they always go home at 6 o'clock and they watch a little TV and drink a beer and go to bed, I'd say, okay, here is your prescription. Uh, as your therapist, I tell you, you must go on Friday nights for at least two hours to the following singles bar. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to order a drink. But you must sit there. And this change in behavior is an opening for all kinds of things to happen. I mean, they will meet someone, not necessarily a lover, but maybe a business opportunity. Or, or someone in that bar will tell them that they have a place in Antigua. If they ever want to go there, they can use it. And then they will. And that will... So the important thing, you see, is to bust them out of their behavioral pattern. And the great thing about psychedelics is that they will do this, that we can self-treat um, ourselves to break down habitual patterns of behavior. Habit is the thing which is running us over the edge. I mean, there's all the yipping and yapping about drug habits, and I agree. I mean, I'm not into hard drugs at all. I find them detractors lead you off the track. Uh, but habituation to substances is only one part of the picture. I mean, we habituate to furniture styles, to colors, to people, to flavors, to television shows, to automobile brands. We are like uh, the addictive creature. And this 
involvement of psyche in things external to the body uh, makes it very difficult for us to discipline ourselves. The most dangerous habits in the world today are not drug habits, they're ideological habits, ways of <coughs> unexamined ways of thinking about reality. You know, uh, racism is an unexamined way of thinking about reality. Sexism, all forms of fascism, unexamined ways of thinking about reality. Busting up habitual behavior patterns is what will do it. That's why these historical changes, you know, the most constipated person in East Germany has had their patterns busted up in the last six months, whether they wanted it or not. Everybody is more flexible. I found this in Europe, that everybody is more flexible and more tolerant than people in America. And the reason is, twice in this century, Europe has been leveled by world war. If, if you don't think that gives you a kind of uh, a cool and an openness and a little more tolerance that we don't have, we're rigid, we're bomb them into the Stone Age people. That's how we deal with our problems. So I think, you know, in ourselves, in society, this habit thing has to be very much in our awareness. The guy who founded general systems theory, Ludwig van Bertalanffy, had a wonderful statement. He said, uh, people are not machines, but in every circumstance where they are given the opportunity to behave like machines, they will do it. They will do it. It's something about how the engine of life seeks to economize energy by using familiar patterns. And if you don't keep turning this and perturbing it and putting new factors into the mix, well, then you run down and, and consciousness contracts and, uh, and you become you know, much more a statistic than a living, breathing uh, human being. Well, that's the ongoing, the continuing carrot of my career. Uh, people always ask me, what will you do if nothing happens? <laughs> and the answer is, my 65th birthday will have occurred a month in front of this. I'll simply retire. <laughs> Shuffle off the stage and uh, <laughs> turn it over to young blood. Uh, well, it's very hard to imagine what will happen. Um, I have, I, perhaps the name of this religion is let's try to imagine what will happen. And then there are many scenarios. A kind of nice scenario that I like is that everyone will behave appropriately. That there will just be this moment, it will sweep around the world where people staring at themselves in the mirror, shaving in the morning and so forth and so on, will just say, you know, all resistance has fallen from the circuits. I now am able to behave appropriately. Well, we don't know what that means. It, the vision I have is uh, of... Uh, people leaving their factories and homes with tears of joy streaming down their faces and staring into the sky as a great radiance settles over them and they are lost to the view of those of us who are not privy to the transformation. It's very much, I mean, just to show you how weird life is, it's very much like the Christian notion of the glory you know, it's just this, ah, and it sweeps over the world. And it takes, it takes everybody. I was very much affected as a child by a terrible B movie, which I've not seen or heard of in 25 years. It was called The 27th Day. And there was this wonderful scene in this movie where it showed people plant wearing those flat pointed hats and planting rice somewhere in Asia. And then it showed them stopping and looking at the sky with tears 
streaming down their faces. And then you saw a bunch of uh, black Africans herding cattle. And then this guy putting his spear in the ground and looking up and his eyes filling with tears. And then about six of these shots around the world. And this probably is what launched me on my career, actually, is the, the wish to see this happen. Uh, how many people ever saw that movie? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, this last year was redone again. Oh, really? Well, if you ever tape it, send it to me. It's a crazy movie. I won't tell the plot. The plot is not at all like that moment. That moment is uh, is the high point. But just this idea that. There is resistance, and if this resistance would fall away, there is an inner nature in us that is seeking to unfold itself. And I don't know whether it's done through technology, or drugs, or God's love, or what it is, but it's a it's a coaxing into being of a higher uh, of a higher state of of understanding. Um, Life in the imagination, I think, you know, going off into the domain of our hopes and dreams. I mean, we are such a peculiar animal and so delicately poised between the bestial and the angelic. I used to have an old professor who said, you know, if you look at this world and uh, and you think of us as descended from the angels, then it's a mess. But if you see us as a near relative of the chimpanzee, then what a peculiar accomplishment, you know? And this is where we hover in this intermediate zone. Yeah. I had this image when you were talking about the looking up, about a massive global MDMA experience on next well, MDMA leading into DMT, leading into the lesser lights. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, why is Western ontology haunted by this notion of the end of the world? You know, the Muslims are into it. The Christians are into it. Everybody's into this to appointing a moment when God comes tangential to history. This is really the thing that is... Uh, Unique besides the monotheistic thing, the the really odd thing about Western religion is the persistent idea that God will come tangential to history, uh, that there will come a moment where the two things cross paths, and you know, for Christianity, Christ is that moment, and uh, theologists, uh, theologians like Karl Barth have described Christ as the axis time. They say, you know, the time leading in to the resurrection was one thing, the time after the resurrection was something else, and, and Christian historiography is based around the axis point of the resurrection, and yet, you know, uh, from the point of view of a Roman empiricist skeptic standing there, this just looks like a small potatoes religious uprising where you drag this guy off and execute him and get things under control again. Uh, then in Christian hermeneutics, the end of the world becomes like a secondary axis time. And then the time between the resurrection and the end of the world you know, before the resurrection, the gates of paradise were closed, according to Christian hermeneutics. And all the souls, they were unable to get in to heaven. They were held in a holding area for several thousand years from the sin of Adam to the resurrection of Christ. Then Christ's entry into heaven, all those souls accompanied him and the, the pipeline was open. And it is open unto, unto the last, uh, the last judgment. But the Christian apocalypse is a vision of a world destroyed, not transformed. And my interpretation of that is, uh, this is the nightmare of the dominator culture coming true. 
I mean, the world, that world is going to be destroyed. And this, you know, this, I, I can't, this idiotic riff about how because he has a strawberry spot, Gorbachev fulfills the prediction of Revelation and is the beast 666. This is the kind of stuff that just drives me straight up the wall. I mean, everybody has been hailed as the beast of Revelations. I think Frederick Barbarossa got it first. Otto the Great of Germany, he was the first one. Then Frederick Barbarossa. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi briefly held the title. And it just sort of moves around. I, I have put, you know, this is all... M- malarkey as far as I'm concerned. I think that the Christianity's myth is of its own overwhelmment, you know. And even in Revelation, the, uh, the Mater Magister comes and destroys the serpent at the end of the world. Definitely, ideological struggles, choices are going to have to be made. It's not, it's not going to be possible to be a mugwump through the next 40 years. You know, a mugwump is somebody who sits on the fence with their mug on one side and their wump on the other. <laughs> And they don't make a decision. They try to, you know, be a liberal and somehow finesse it through and make everybody happy. I don't know if that's going uh, to be possible. Yeah. Uh, in talking about these uh, these tangential experiences with uh, with God as uh, signifying this acceleration or ending uh, event. Uh, it seems like the, the UFO experience would be like that. Since we're polling, I want to see if there are, there are a number of people, most people here said they had uh, seen or experienced the uh, elves. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a couple, several had experienced the end of time. Had, has anybody here ever had an encounter with a, without being stoned? Uh, with a UFO. Seen a UFO and taken away. I didn't. I didn't consider myself stoned. <laughs> well, I hadn't slept for ten days. That's why there's a qualifier. Well, I think that the UFO is the 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 or myth of the concrescence. That's what I call this thing that happens in 2012. The concrescence. It's the compression of all complexity into a single spinning object that when you look into this spinning object even though it's the size of a hard ball there are stars inside of it and you realize that it is a it's a holographic matrix it isn't the matter of this world it's made out of holographic translinguistic matter it's somehow a, a doorway into the imagination we used to imagine this stuff which could do anything, which was the precursor to the flying saucer. Uh, and, you know, you could eat this stuff, and it was food. You could stretch it out like silly putty and stand under it, and you could take a shower under it. Or you could stretch it out bigger and sit on it, and it would fly you around places. It also would become, you know, a telephone, an automobile, whatever. It's just a localized part of space under the complete control of your own imagination. Uh, the flying... So- I, I, I don't know what to think about whether there are friendly entities on the way. It sort of depends on how stoned I am. I mean, there's one way of looking at the local universe where you just can't believe that this stuff goes unmonitored. That if that probably, as we unravel the early history of the Earth, it's beginning to look like the forces which created this situation are pretty statistically improbable. I mean, you not only have to have a planet around the right kind of star, but you need to have a moon around that planet of a mass, very, you know, unusually large mass for the satellite, and so forth and so on. So it may be that life is pretty rare. Well, the rarer it is, 
you may bet the more intensely it will eff- it will make the effort to monitor and locate other examples of itself. So, you know, it, it may be that the great attractor that drew humanness out of animal organization is the product of some kind of interaction with an intelligence, but it may not deal on the level of individuals. I find it hard to believe that they will come down in little ships and tromp out and read us our Miranda rights. I doubt that it works like that, but there may be extraterrestrial tugs on the development. Seeing something totally unexplainable will provide a tug on uh, a lot. Well, one of the interesting things about UFOs from the new way of analyzing them, the old style was to say, what are they and where do they come from? Since that got us nowhere for 30 years, the new style of UFO analysis is to say, what are they doing to human populations? Suddenly then, you can use polling and statistics and interview techniques and all kinds of stuff to... If, if they have a purpose, then we should be able to figure out the purpose, not by asking them the purpose, but by analyzing the implementation of their, the changes they've set in motion. Well, the only thing everybody can agree about what the flying saucers have accomplished is they've shaken people's faith in science. Isn't that interesting? They're like a compensatory image from the unconscious that's saying to the dominator ego, your model doesn't work. There are parts of reality that are completely outside the domain of your description. And uh, I think flying saucers are pretty upsetting to scientists. Uh, That seems to be where their major impact is, as on very straight people and then, of course, in the trailer courts. But uh, I don't know if the if if there is an extraterrestrial influence. I don't know if it will ever tip its hat or not. To me, the really the the strangest thing about all this, and that I can't generate enough excitement about, are the beings. The beings are confounding. I mean, you can imagine a psychedelic experience entirely without beings. There's wonderful insights, beautiful colors, architectural vistas, visions. Of, but the beings just tip the scales to where you say, hey, you know, what's going on? The world isn't supposed to be organized like this. I mean, psychological insights I can handle, but elves bearing gifts? Uh, what's that about? And... Uh, I suppose this position of straight people is that it doesn't happen. And why do so many people experience that same phenomenon? Well, they're insane. They've been deluded by Terence McKenna, who has launched a kind of hysteria where then people think they see elves. You're hypnotized. Yes. So then this is the magic wand that is waved over any unpleasant evidence. I mean, uh, look, for example, at dousing. I mean, I don't give a hoot about dousing, but uh, people do it year after year, make money at it, get paid, uh, demonstrate their ability, and science says, you know, it's nonsense, it's garbage, nothing is happening. Well, and it just goes on and on. It's just been ruled out of bounds. Certain things are so troubling and they seem so trivial because they're saying, well, look here, we've got science. It's telling us about distant galaxies, the heart of the atom, DNA. It's really working. And you want the evidence of the psychedelic experience to overthrow this explanatory tool? No way. It's too operationally useful. Well, that's a bit of candid uh, rhetoric there. Yes, it is operationally useful, but this means we've moved entirely away from the notion of the facts of the matter. Now it means we just use what's operationally useful. And you'll remember I told you at the beginning of this thing that uh, uh, we need to find out what is true so that we can do what is right, you know? 
and then as an example of that, uh, you know, in talking about all this apocalyptic speculation and so forth, uh, what would it be like, or, or what lessons could we draw if we were to get all hyped up, create a green world, save the rainforest, and on December 22nd, 2012, the sun explodes. <laughs> you know, this would be a rather wry comment on, on the nature of the political and consciousness-raising enterprise. In other words, you've got to know what you're dealing with for your plan to make any sense. You get no points for saving the rainforest if the sun explodes. It means it was a stupid waste of time. And what you should have been doing was preparing, going all out in the technological direction, trying to create an arc to get out of here and, uh, and back... Save Everybody Foundation. All, all life on Earth uh, would be pulling for you. In fact, as long as, we're, uh, as long as we're on this topic, you know, there is a problem with stellar dynamics. There is a problem with uh, getting nuclear theory to agree with measurements coming off the sun. The sun is not producing enough neutrinos it should be producing a third more. This is a pretty serious uh, problem for nuclear chemistry. Nuclear chemistry has been in place 50 years. It's not accustomed to having its predictions off by 35%. And yet, the, and they're building these huge things in North Dakota, miles under the ground that they fill with cleaning fluid and, and observe for release of Cherenkov radiation, and they're not seeing enough. Well, the only explanation for this is that the nuclear furnace of the sun has gone off the boil, that uh, something has happened in the core of the sun and it will take, they estimate, about 35,000 years from this event's beginning for physical processes to reflect it on the surface of the sun. In other words, it takes 35,000 years for it to percolate to the surface of the sun. But if it went off the nuclear boil, the neutrino output would have dropped instantly and that doesn't take 35,000 uh, uh, 35, years to reach the surface. It happens instantly because neutrinos move at the speed of light. So it may be that this, these glaciations and this cooling and all the stuff that's been going on over the past million years, that the sun is in a f kind of sputtering phase where it's losing and regaining the ability to carry out fusion uh, uh, in its core. Well, if this is true, then it all makes sense, horribly enough. It means that biology is um, senses the impending total echo crisis and is frantically attempting to accelerate evolution to produce a way out, a technological species that could create the kind of machinery that could lift a significant portion of the biota out of the path of disaster. We need to understand if this is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, another possibility is, you know, when you analyze the history of the Earth, there is repeated evidence of major asteroidal impact. This thing 65 million years ago, nothing larger than a chicken walked away from. You know, last January, there was what they call an Earth crosser. It crossed within a half a million miles of Earth, a Dumbo-shaped object five kilometers across. The uh, recalculation for the return of this object, it's imprecise because they didn't get a perfect fix on it, but the return Earth cross is predicted for late in 2012. Uh, what? It's, a, it's an asteroid. 
It's an Earth-crossing asteroid. There are a number of these Earth-crossing asteroids, and there are a number of punctuations in the fossil record that seem to indicate that these things come down with reasonable regularity. So I think you know we need to open ourselves to, to the record of nature, the silent witness of nature, the stratigraphy of, and, the, and the levels of radiation in the Earth. And we also need to think in term, in global and planetary terms. I mean, let's be frank about what this is about. We are a species. We are knitted to other species. We want to live. The previous style of social dynamics has been no organizational plan at all, Mm -hmm. no global sense of anything. The social program of the last 500 years has been plunder. Let's plunder. And then that's what we've been doing. But now, you know, we've plundered enough and you raise yourself out of the gutter of plunder and say, you know, we've got to pull back. Or go somewhere else and plunder. Or go somewhere else and plunder. But the problem is we've gotten so into the plunder style that we've lost the fine touch. It's not clear that we can get it together enough to get off of here. It's going to be a major test of human cooperation to survive the meltdown of global civilization. One of the things that completely freaks me out about, the only thing really that completely freaks me out about what's going on in the Soviet Union is, you know, I applaud perestroika. I want to get rid of the Communist Party. I think the military needs to be kicked around and so forth and so on. But don't fumble away your ability to deliver large payloads into near-Earth orbit. If they blow it and fumble away that ability, then there ain't no way off this rock because the American space program is smoke and mirrors. You can forget it. Only the Russians have boosters large enough. And if you let one of these design team, engineering, assembly line configurations fall to pieces, It would take 15 to 20 years. You know, they can't even find the blueprints for the Saturn V rocket. They, somebody misplaced them. It's, they don't know. They found part of it. They're looking. So, uh, you know, we, people think psychedelic uh, consciousness is a permission to escapism. I don't think so. I think it's a, it's a, Uh, an invitation to a high degree of awareness, the real options, the real nature of the predicament, not as it's culturally defined, but uh, as it is defined by reality. Uh, You become aware of all this. You feel into the facts. Uh, I mean, you you are uh, connected to the rhythm of flux, and this leaves no room for unconsciousness. Unconsciousness is what is destroying us as a species. It's a luxury of hunter-gatherers. It's absolutely fatal to thermonuclear high techies like ourselves. I mean, we can't have enrageable apes locked up inside our brains. Not when we have our fingers on thermonuclear arsenals and that sort of thing. We have to chill out get serious about uh, the human enterprise. Uh, We have come this far through unimaginable hell. I mean, the people, the nobility of our ancestors, what they went through without antibiotics, without penicillin, without uh, uh, wall-to-wall beige carpeting, I mean, it has been a long pull over the last 150,000 million years. Five times the ice has ground south from the poles a mile deep or more, splitting and islanding human populations and bringing, you know, tremendous hardship. Our, Our people have had it very, very tough. I mean, we are not strong in tooth and claw. All of our adaptations were to preserve tiny populations. I mean, the estimation is that at the height of the, ne- of the Neanderthal period, there were less than 40,000 individuals in Europe. 
I mean, tiny, tiny human populations. And against all odds and being smart, 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 these people brought us to this point. And now, you know, it's our turn. And uh, we have it within our power to do something. They had it within their power only to hand on the flame of hope, of aspiration, of shamanic imaginings. But it's given to us, if we play it right, to actually take those hopes and turn it into a conflagration of transformation that will burn away the dross of history and recover and reunite the various parts of the human legacy in a way that will give permission for a sane and caring world. The prodigal journey into history was for a purpose. The purpose was a technological prowess, the perfection of the tool-creating impulse. And at the end of history comes the ultimate tool, the flying saucer, the omniprogrammable Macintosh, the, the machine which does anything. And that perfected tool is lethal then in the theater of its creation. It has to be carried back into archaic nature and we have to begin to deconstruct, dematerialize, retreat, begin a a feminizing of our attitude toward ourselves and nature. Care, encouragement, reflection, rather than dominance, utilization, destruction. Uh, If we don't do this, I think that uh, our situation is fairly precarious. And the whole point of talking about psychedelics in this context is they make this something other than an inspiring after-dinner speech. Because you've heard this speech before. This is what all good guys say, but they don't. there's no hope for it without psychedelics because they impel you to change behavior, to think new thoughts, to see deeper into reality, to aspire higher, and to feel more. And if we can't awaken ourselves to those things then uh, it's simply not going to happen. And all the, all the, uh, the means, the tools, the gnosis, the shamans, they still exist at the periphery of this doomed civilization. They still exist to help us toward a new understanding. But we have to clarify this for ourselves in our own minds. We need to try these ideas out on other people, even the most skeptical of people. This idea can stand on its own two feet. It can compete in the marathon of ideas. It's as respectable as any of these other answers. It cannot be sneered into non-existence, which is currently the establishment approach to it. Is, is just, you know, we're deluded, our brains are damaged, we've taken so many drugs, we don't understand the real uh, nature of power and politics and society. Well, this is all coming from people who claim they do, and look at the mess they've made of it. So I don't think there's any reason to hang our heads. This is religion as it was practiced the first million years. This is social responsibility as it was practiced the first million years. And uh, uh, for us to take it up is nothing more than for us to return to the last moment in our own story when everything made sense. And I maintain that last moment was in that partnership paradise in uh, Saharan Africa. Now we have to go forward into the past. This is the way to create a unified meaning to what has happened to us. Because if this just ends in a toxified and ruined planet, then you know what a comment on uh, the values that we hold most dear, our belief that life is for something, 
our belief that integrity matters, our belief that our transmission from generation to generation was something that was important. We, the, the meaning of it all is in the hands of the living. Those people, a hundred thousand years in the grave, their meaning is in our hands because the question is, what shall we do with what they have given us? Well, that's it. That's the question that I want to leave you.